Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. We welcome Claudia Rankin and welcome back to our stage Viet Than Nguyen, who last interviewed Walter Mosley for us. That video, along with over 300 other conversations, are in our YouTube channel. Claudia and Viet discuss her book, Just Us, An American Conversation. Claudia is the author of Citizen, an American Lyric, and four previous books, including Don't Let Me Be Lonely, an American Lyric. She is a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, the winner of the 2014 Jackson Poetry Prize, and a contributing editor of Poets and Writers. She received a MacArthur Fellowship in 2016 and is a professor of poetry at Yale. Viet's novel, The Sympathizer, won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and numerous other awards. His other books include The Refugees, Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War and Race, and Resistance, Literature and Politics in Asian America. He is a professor of English, American Studies and Ethnicity, and Comparative Literature at the University of Southern California. He also received a MacArthur Fellowship. The sequel to The Sympathizer, The Committed, will be published in 2021. Welcome again to both of you. I'll let you take it from here, Viet. Thanks so much, Ted. Hi, Claudia. Hi, Ted. Hi, Hi Viet. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm, I'm great. I, I love, the, I can see your book back there. Yeah, a little bit of ruthless <laughs> self-promotion, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. Great. Congratulations. Well, you know, I think, thank you. I, I, think, I think most of the, uh, the audience does not know that there was this brief window in time where you and I were almost colleagues at the University of Southern California. And in fact, there was a few weeks where the office next to mine had your name on the door. I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen. Well, but, you know, I, I I almost to also had to do with you because, you know, it was very exciting to think of you as my colleague. Yeah. But, you well, know, life, the fires, I ran from the fires. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's true. The smoke is finally cleared. But um, anyway, so it's really always a pleasure to have a chance to talk to you, especially about Just Us. Of course, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of all your work, including Citizen, the, the work that I think really brought you to the national consciousness outside of the world of poetry. And Just Us is, I think, posited very clearly as a, a sequel or a continuation of some of the issues that, that were raised in Citizen, but also a very significant departure as well. But the first thing I want to talk about is just the physical nature of the book. Citizen was already a beautiful book, but Just Us is on another level, I think. When I I'd read the book as a PDF, impressed by the content of the book, but just wasn't prepared for seeing it as a physical object when it arrived in the mail. And of course, in the chaos of my house, I misplaced the, the book, but I think you have it. Maybe you can show it to us. Of course, yeah. yeah. I think it's just something to be admired. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's, 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 it's on glossy paper. It's got beautiful photographs, full color photographs, charts, notes. Uh, it's just meticulously designed. Yes, there you go. Uh, how, as an author, frankly, I'm envious. <laughs> You're able to do this for Citizen and for Just Us. Can you talk, talk to us about the process of just making the book into the physical object that it is? Well, the... Um... Thanks for that. The, the, one of the things that's always really important to me with each book is how the structure and the content work together. And because I feel as if the structure should somehow be in conversation with the content. And I'm lucky enough to work with Grey Wolf. I will never leave them <laughs> because um, I don't think many publishers would allow me to design, the cover, the interior. And this was a very challenging book to put together because of the moving parts. And it really felt like everybody at Grey Wolf was on board <laughs> with the, um, the various things. But I'm, I'm really interested in the relationship, as you know, between image and text. And and also the experience of reading. What happens when you're reading text and you look over and you see an image? Sort of what does it do to your brain in terms of having to go to the part of you that apprehends images as you are reading text? And, and so I'm, I'm sort of interested in a kind of experimental mode of of bringing those two things together. And this book extended past Citizen in the sense that it also employed, as you um, 
noted charts, um, all kinds of other tweets, photographs, etc. Okay, so since you brought that up, I just want to talk about the charts and the and the scholarly sources and the texts. You deploy a particular way of talking about your citations that differs from from Citizen. I remember actually in reading one review of Don't Let Me Be Lonely, the reviewer said, I don't, I don't really like the way all the footnotes are at the end of the book. Um, and this seems to be a common strategy in poetry, obviously, that the poet at the end of the book has a list of acknowledgments and sources for what they do. Here you do something very different, which is you put these sources, the text, uh, the, you, I think what you call the fact checks, right in the middle of the text as you deal with them. Why was that important for you to, to do that? Because the, the activity, the process of the book is um, about what does it mean to be involved in a conversation and also critically frame that conversation, wonder about it, have curiosity about it while you're engaged in the encounter. So I wanted to figure out a way to make that process of wondering the apparent on the page. So in the conversation, I might say something, but then there's a red dot, almost like those laser things that point to the text. And it refers you over to the fact checking, which could adjust the information in the essay. You know, I might say something from memory and it's off. And so the fact check will immediately reposition it into facts. And I really was um, invested in this because we are in a moment now under this administration where fake news has become news. And, you know, it, it's like everybody's running around trying to bring the statements of the president back into the world of the real, of, of actual facts. You know, one of the things I've appreciated writing op-eds and magazine pieces for things like Time and the New York Times is that they, they do fact check me. And like you say, sometimes you, you're writing in the heat of the moment, you're, you're putting something out that you think you remember correctly. And of course, the fact checker says, well, did this actually get said in exactly this way? And sometimes it's actually very beneficial to go back to some legendary source and realize that you are misquoting the original and that the misquote has actually been circulating all over the place, which is why you remember it. Exactly. Now, you brought up that... Um, your, your much of your work is dealing with image, the relationship of image to text, but there's also a relationship between image and racism, sexism, domination. Your work and the work of many others points out that how these discourses of power have operated in the last few centuries has often been through the image that we think about race, about sex, with particular kinds of racialized or eroticized images, especially around black people and black women. And I'm just wondering if there's any tension in your work between that history of thinking about black bodies and black women in particular visually in, in, in a spectrum that ranges from, from hatred to sexualized objectification and what happens in the physical nature of your book where so much of the power of the book comes from the beauty of the book and the beauty of the images that you're, you're putting in there, even if the history and the subject matter is oftentimes very, very difficult. Well, yes, I, I wanna go back for a minute to um, what you said about um, writing journalism and that pushing us into the realm of fact-checking. And I, I had forgotten for a second that the first piece um, the first essay in Just Us um, on approaching white men and asking them about white privilege was written for the New York Times. And so the structure of that, of having to have that fact checked and having to look through it in that way really set the tone for all of the other essays. So that was a good um, reminder. In terms of the image use, you know, the, um, Sarah Lewis, uh, the, the, um, the um, professor at Harvard who writes on Frederick Douglass, made the point that Frederick Douglass was the most photographed man of the 19th century. And, and, and if we close our eyes, we can actually see Douglass. You know, I, 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 when I went to her lecture, she um, said that and I did close my eyes and there he was. And he did that on purpose because he was trying to combat 
all of the images of black people as slaves or enslaved. And so he, um, he just had himself photograph and, and put that out. So the power of the image is something that is also interesting to me and to the text. Um, and I wanted images in this text to show how um, black people, many times black women, were positioned inside the gaze of whiteness, it, surrounded by police, surrounded by um, screaming white women um, in some cases, Surra you know, just again and again, the repetition of the lone black person in this sort of white world. And you can, you can talk about it, write about it, but when you see it, when you see those girls trying to go to school and the white women yelling at them um, and the attempt to integrate schools, that, that image is very different from me writing about it. So I wanted to have um, both contrasting modes of entering a moment present at the same time. You know, I'm also teaching a class on colonization and decolonization at the moment, and I just wanted to bring my preoccupation into our, our conversation. And I think there's some connections and overlap, and I just want to hear your reaction to it, which is, you know, I'm, we're reading a cluster of thinkers uh, who have dealt with blackness globally and under colonization, people like Frantz Fanon, Aimé Césaire, Albert Memmi, and each of them have, have made connections between the experiences of black people in Africa and under French colonialism in the Caribbean and in France with the experiences of black Americans. And you quote Césaire actually uh, in Don't Let Me Be Lonely when Césaire talks about how life is not a spectacle and we have to, we have to engage. Fanon's work has been really crucial to the idea of the visuality of the black body and how so much of, of racism is, is pinned to the look and the, and the skin. And Memi, in his uh, American dedication to the colonizer and the colonized, says the, he, he dedicates it to what he calls the American Negro, who is also colonized. So this is a moment in the 50s and 60s where you know, the decolonial movement was, was making connections between what was happening in the United States and what was happening in other countries that were already that were explicitly colonized at that moment. So do you think there's any connection? Does that still have validity? Does that still have power in trying to think about locating Black Americans under a regime of, of colonization and linking it to your more, your concerns that are more about you know, racism and, and Afro-pessimism? I think, I actually think, yes. The book that comes to mind immediately, actually, is Teresa Cha's Dictate, one where she um, looks at Korea through all of the colonizers and then moves the Korean into the American landscape and also sees America as in the tradition of the French, the Chinese, etc. But for, for me, I feel um, that America as the colonizer, you know, the, the um, Europeans who came over, um, basically murdered Native Americans, took the land, brought Blacks as slaves. That mindset that now this is ours and, and people are subject to their power, they have like planted their flag on, on this land, is I think the mindset that controls white supremacy and brings us forward to this time. So even something like mass incarceration is a reinstating, I mean, Elizabeth, um, um, Alexandra writes about this, um, this, this notion that the mass incarceration is a continuation of slavery, which means that black people and Latinx people to some extent are considered the property of the colonizer in a sense. So I, I, I think it's a, it's a line of inquiry that, that works now, especially when you attach it to mass incarceration and the numbers of black men who ha and women who have been incarcerated. Yeah, I think there's a portion of, uh, the, of the United States that does not want to see connections between past and present and the endurance of things like white supremacy and 
the continuation of practices from the slave era and uh, slavery era and reconstruction and so on up in, you know, up until the present and its current manifestations like mass incarceration and drug laws and things like that. But I think your work does want to see these kinds of connections. You, you grapple very seriously with a particular genealogy of black thinking, uh, part of which is described as Afro-pessimism, as I mentioned. And I'm not sure how many of, of our viewers will know what that is. I mean, it's a term that has been getting increasing visibility, but you cite some of the thinkers in this vein uh, from Orlando Patterson's notion of social death, that you know, even after the end of slavery, black people experienced social death. Frank Wilderson III in today's era you know, coined the term Afro-pessimism. You quote Fred Moten, who talks about how, in his words, nothing survives uh, in, this, in this era for, for black people. And then lastly, Sadia Hartman, you quote her a few times about the afterlife of slavery, that it still endures today. So I'm wondering if you can explain for the audience what Afro-pessimism is and what your relationship to it is. Well, I, I, you know, I'm, I don't think I'm the best person to explain it, but my understanding of it is the sense that um, Black people in this country have never reached the position of human. Um, that we are um, maintain the status of property or outside the systems of governing. Um, and not only are we outside, we will never be inside. We can never be in, so we can never <laughs> gain access. We can never be fully human within the American system in the way in which it's been organized. Um, so, and I think it's very useful to think about that if we're going to think about connections like slavery to mass incarceration. Um, but, I don't think we can act as if it's true. Because if we act as if it's true, if we divorce ourselves from the, the electoral process, for example, voting, then we have absolutely no say in anything. Um, and we have seen that if we use our full force of our power aligned with say Asian Americans or Latinx Americans, we can actually force the system one way or another. And, and that's how um, Barack Obama was elected. So I, this idea that we're so outside that we might not, we might as well not be in, try attempt to be inside is where I sort of part company with Afro-Pessimists. But, but the thinking behind it in terms of the reality of certain systems is absolutely right as far as far as my understanding is right. yeah um, and then certainly in the, the the premise of your book is that there has to be a strain of optimism what degree of optimism will we'll talk about <laughs> or you know, activity you know. of optimism <laughs> <laughs> well let's get into this because uh, and let's get into the book um, more specifically you know you, you went from citizen and american lyric to just us and american conversation so I have a two-part question. And the first one is why that shift from lyric to conversation in, in these two books? Well, I, I think when I began work on Just Us, it began, as I said, with the, with the conversation with white men in airplanes. And that was right at the time of the election when 62% of white men voted in a president who said, I, um, I'm racist, I'm a nationalist. Um, I don't want foreigners in this country. I don't want immigrants in this country if they're not, you know, from Norway. Um, you know, he was saying all of these things and white American men said, I'm good with that. And 47% of white American women said, I'm good with that. Um, 45, I mean, 45% voted for Hillary. 
And, and then huge margins of people did not vote at all because they claimed there was no difference between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, despite their platforms. And, um, and so we end up in a place uh, three and a half years later where the entire country is devastated and not because of the pandemic. The pandemic has been mismanaged by somebody who has used it in service of his reelection and um, um, suppressed information that he has had in his, you know, since, since December, perhaps. So I started the book thinking about why why are these people voting for this kind of regime? And, and we, we need to begin to talk to everyone around us because I think if we are not careful, we are going to be fully entrenched inside a fascist government. And so coalition building in a way was behind this book. We have to start talking to each other, which is not to say that we become another. There are many publics in the United States. That's what's amazing about it, that we are living side by side. And, um, and difference is a thing that we can hold together. And so, I, I, so the idea was really to go into um, an exercise where I would begin these conversations or put, push these conversations to their crisis so we can see where the difference comes into play and see what happens when we go beyond it. Um, because I, you know, I, I, I don't know about you, but I am terrified <laughs> about where we're going. I mean, just put this into context, uh, we're, we're pre-recording this and, and last night Ruth Bader Ginsburg died and of course my social media feed was flooded with grief, rage, and exactly. despair, right? So it's, it's as if the, the, this, the world we're living in has been scripted to, to push us into the most extreme set of confrontations and choices that the American people can make. And, and in order to make them, we have to get together or else we will end up in a really horrible position for people, all of us, actually. Well, there's, a, there's one set of conversations that takes place in the book around the possibilities of coalition building with sympathetic allies or possible allies. But then there's another set of conversations, ones you just mentioned, with uh, a certain kind of white man or a certain kind of electorate that is, that is not aligned or even possibly aligned with, with your worldview. And there are a lot of people in this country, obviously, who've written off the possibility of that kind of a conversation. So to even initiate that possibility puts you on the optimistic side of the American spectrum at this moment. Um, and at the, one of the opening chapters uh, is titled, What If? You talk about the various possibilities. What if we did this? What if we did that? What if we had this kind of conversation or another kind of conversation? And there, I think there's both a utopian and a dystopian possibility to the question of what if. I mean, things can go either way. And uh, having conversations can be risky. Did you feel that to be a possibility uh, when you were writing this book and having these conversations that you were taking risks in talking to people? I didn't, I didn't think I was taking risks. I mean, I think um, I, the conversations would have happened whether or not I was writing the book. These are conversations that actually just came out of my life with the exception of the first one, where I was pushing um, these white men to actually talk about what, it, what white male privilege meant to them. Um, but I do think that my concern about what, like how, um, oh, let me put it this way. Teshe Cole writes, he wrote this thing um, called um, the white industrial savior complex, something like that, uh, the white savior industrial complex. And, um, and in it, he talks about how you have racism without racists. And I think that 
in focusing only on the devastation inside black communities, we have allowed white people not to see how they're implicated in that. And, and therefore they've not had to be accountable to it. And so, you know, in these conversations, what's been different for me is that I have, I, you know, risking the social contract of civility, I have tried to, to say, if this is happening, it's because you're aligned with white supremacy. And that's considered, you know, not nice, but it is the truth. And, um, and even I mentioned before Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, the argument of that book is that, you know, if Reagan, Clinton, all of these people hadn't put the mechanisms around in private prisons, creating mass incarceration, if the judges and the, and the um, juries and the police were in cahoots with it, you wouldn't have all those people either dead or arrested. So this, we can't continue pretending that the systems are not fully um, recognized and um, controlled by ordinary Americans. You know, and, and th this includes our neighbors, the people, everybody who votes, everybody who sits on a jury, everyone who calls himself a lawyer, you know, everybody. It's interesting to me, uh, given what you've said, that you opened the book with an epigraph from Richard Pryor, uh, where he talks about, I believe, you've gone looking for, for justice and you found just us, hence the title of your book. And I found the citation of Pryor really interesting because another recent book that works somewhere overlapping yours is Kathy Park Hong's Minor Feelings. Uh, and she, you know, Richard Pryor plays a prominent, prominent, prominent place in her book. There you go. Yeah, as she grapples with her feelings of rage uh, about what it means to be an Asian American and an Asian American woman in this country, especially for Asian Americans, the, the, our relationship to rage is different than it is for Black Black Americans. Right? We're not supposed to be angry. So for Kathy to be angry is really critical, uh, and for her to cite Richard Pryor as someone who gives her license and a model for 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 channeling that anger in a certain way. And of course, I think Pryor is, is part of a tradition of, of Black comedians who have used their comedy, not just to tell jokes, which is important, but also to do what you say, which is to initiate conversations, to, to say things that are, are not a part of the social contract, to point to white people and their complicity in certain kinds of things. For example, I recently rewatched Dave Chappelle's, uh, one of his mm -hmm. first taped monologues from 20 years ago. And uh, it, much of it was about police brutality. And he took, of course, it was a series of jokes. Tw mm -hmm. 20 years later, watching it, it has a completely different sensation, especially, I, I, I think I watched it right after he taped his, his special in the aftermath of, of George Floyd, where it was not funny, but it was mostly anger, right? So the strain that you're working from of confronting white supremacy and not just like, KKK white supremacy, but latent white supremacy, mass the civility is, is really crucial. And uh, I, I was, I'm wondering if you have a connection to, to, if you have something to say about, you know, prior and black, black comedy, because the question of humor does come up in your book. Yeah, I mean, I, I also love Kathy Park Hong's um, Minor Feelings. And, and I love the fact that she herself was training herself to do stand up. Um, while she was working on on this, in you know, initially, uh, justice was called justice because I was wanting the intimacy of um, you know who's coming to dinner, justice of that, and um, and then I I had the manuscript and the artists. Um, Alexandra Bell, she, she does the counter narratives with the New York Times. She read it and she said, oh, did you get Just Us from Richard Pryor? And I said, 
No, I didn't, but let me go back and look at the prior. And when I looked at the prior, I was fascinated by both what he meant and what he didn't mean. You know, so that the idea of just us, I go down to the courthouse um, for justice and find that it's just us, and that just us falls outside of justice for him. It's black people. In, um, but I also like the idea that I go down to the courthouse for justice and just us is only white people, like the only people who get the justice and administer the justice are white people. Mm -hmm. So I love the kind of, um, and that's how it ended up in the, um, in the epigraph. But in the book itself, I think that, I, you know, my, my personal feeling about comedy is that it's one of the few places where you can bring in the reality of the moment, all of it, the bad and the good of it, and people can hold it all. And the, the joke of it is that you have brought in the worst and the best. It's like the bittersweet um, scenario. And um, so I, I, I kind of wanted this book to live in that place where everything gets to be present. Um, I too love the Dave Chappelle response to Floyd's um, murder and the way he weaved the narrative of all of those killings and the police was fascinating to me because I remembered the events so clearly. I, I, you were in LA when, when um, the, the police, the black policemen killed people and then drove into the hills and, and there was that big, and I was there as well. And I love that he began with that and then brought it forward. So, you know, I, those were real events um, with tragic endings, mostly for black people. And so I, 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 I just think that the um, comedy is a good way to move into a lot of these subjects. Let me just read a brief part from your book where you talk about humor. It might be a failing that I want people to lose their humorlessness, but I badly want us all to have a kind of meta perspective humor around all that goes into our scramble to escape what Fred Moten names the false fight for our humanity that has lasted 400 years and is not the same thing as fighting for our civil rights. What, why is it a failing that you want people to lose their humorlessness and what, what is the meta perspective humor that you're talking about? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's, it maybe feels like it's in bad form to, to turn serious issues into something that's funny. But I think if we were allowed to do that, we would then be allowed to keep everything in the room at one time. And because, um, we're not allowed to do that. We can't see where we're failing as well, in a way. I mean, that's one of the things I love about the Fano, that Fano talks about colonialism, the impact of it, but he also is looking at the psychological impact on um, the colonized people and what that does to you psychologically and what, what kind of um, adjustments you make that might not be the best adjustments along the way to be able to live your life. And that sometimes creates a kind of humor. And so that's, that's what I mean. If we, could, if, if we could laugh about things, then maybe we could hold them. I, I guess I'm talking about what are the different strategies we could allow ourselves so that we could keep the entire history in the room at all times. I'm a big admirer of Paul Beatty's The Sellout and, and, his, and the, yeah. his other work as well, you know, where humor is absolutely important to the, to the political critique that he, that he wants to make. And exactly. going up the, how we were all caught up in the absurdities. It's not just white people who are trapped in it, but, you know, those of us who have been racialized sometimes do some things that need to be lampooned as well. And so humor is a really critical political tool. And uh, there's no doubt that Just Us is a very political book as well. 
I just want to go back to the question of risk um, because I think there, to me, it, it seems like the book is doing some risky things. Um, for example, I think that the book does require that you be vulnerable. You talk in certain ways. So there's, there's another portion of the book where you say, um, I felt certain that as a black writer, there had to be something I didn't understand. Uh, and so part of the book, project of the book is for you to try to figure out what it is that you don't understand, which I think is, is risky because many people don't want to know what they don't understand. It's more comfortable to, 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 to be ensconced in your own, in, in your own uh, the security of your own ignorance. But part of this project of having conversations deliberately or otherwise is for you to find the limits of your, your knowledge or your theory. And there's a moment when you confess to having um, non-white fragility you know, we're, we're at this moment in time, the, the term white fragility has a lot of positive and negative connotations depending on your political perspective, but you confess to having non-white fragility. I'm just wondering if you can take us a little bit further down that road. What, what was the moment of non-white fragility? And what, what, what did you feel that you, did you discover what it is that you didn't understand initially? Well, I think, I mean, even the fact checking is a way to say, I don't know a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, the bringing in all of the the critic the critics like Moton and is another way of saying I'm relying on all of these people in my attempt to understand. Um, the vulnerability is to admit that this is not just about um, educating white people. This is about educating myself because I am at times in a world that overwhelms me. And I am trying to navigate a life for my child, for myself, for my family, um, the best I know how. And, um, and I wanted in part those, you know, somebody wrote somewhere, oh, she's, She's using um, fact checking so white people can see that to believe her so that they can, you know, what she says can be um, fact checked by them when they're reading, but that wasn't it at all. I was using fact check to show that in fact, I don't know. I don't know. And I am trying to know because I need to understand, because I need to know how to make the next steps in my life. So in that way, I think you're right. It, it is a kind of vulnerability that asks us what happens when we come to the limits of our knowing? How are we then going to move forward? What can I build, like even talking to you, Ben, what can you and I build together through this conversation that will allow me to know you a little bit better and you to know me a little bit better? which doesn't mean that you are not you and I am not me. And, and so the mechanisms of the book re really was about saying, okay, I'm gonna put myself out there, not as somebody who knows everything. I could have pretended that once I fact checked the facts that that's what I actually said. I mean, I'm writing it, I, <laughs> I could just switch it around, but I didn't wanna do that because I wanted to show that we are all struggling towards trying to be better um, in order to make a thing that's better, that's bigger than us. The, uh, around, the, around what you just said, you know, I, I felt that for me, two of the most compelling conversations that you have in the book come around in these chapters called social contract and ethical loneliness. So let's talk about that for a while. Um, in social contract, uh, you, you find yourself as the lone black person in, uh, at a dinner in someone's house. Uh, I assume everybody else is, is a white person. There's an the Asian um, man and, yeah. See, that was what I was afraid of hearing, okay? It's like, it's like that moment in Get Out. I mean, Asian Americans freaked out over Get Out because, oh my God. You had to have an Asian American guy, you had to be on the side <laughs> of the white people. Uh, so maybe that'll come up in our conversation here, but it's, it's a very uncomfortable mo moment you describe in social contract where you describe yourself as disrupting the social contract of what it is that the, the lone black person in a room of white and white aligned liberals 
should say or not or should say or not say. And it's a very tense moment uh, for you, but for other people, uh, where you. Well, I'll let you describe it. <laughs> it was your your moment. Well, it's a dinner party that um, came about because of a, a with people I didn't know, but we all had a thing we had to do, so we ended up at dinner together in someone's house, and um, and one of the the guests was writing a book on uh, why people voted for Trump, and he said that you know. The majority, he felt, were um, motivated by economics. And I said, but couldn't we give them the benefit of the doubt that they ran on his platform, which was um, racist, basically. And he kept saying, well, that was a small part of it, but economics. And I would say racism. And he would say economics. <laughs> And, and that went on for a bit. And then finally, a, the white woman who I think was his wife was sitting across from me and she looked at the brownies and she said, oh my God, those brownies are beautiful. They look so good. And, and I turned to her and it was a choice. And I knew at that moment, and this I guess is the moment of risk. I said to her, um, am I being silenced? And that moment was it was like <laughs> a moment where everybody's attention got focused <laughs> if people were you know chewing everything stopped and she looked down at her plate and the host was sitting next to me and i could feel the rage i literally could feel it um and but that's you know it was i thought you know i'm just gonna push this and see what it's like on the other side of this moment. Instead of being silenced, instead of letting the brownies take over, which is kind of funny now I, <laughs> I think about it. And you know, and that's a place where I thought humor could have helped us. You know, if she had said something like, um, I don't know, yeah, you're being silenced because, you know, whatever she says. But it, it, instead it was, you are bad, <laughs> you know, don't behave like that. And, and then I became, I did become silent as a kind of um, mode of resistance that seemed childish to me at the time, but I still maintained it, so. Yeah, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful moment because I think part of the power of the moment is that it's not something that's splashed in, in, the, in the news. It's, it's a very quotidian moment that people experience all the time, obviously. And I think one of the things you say in that chapter is, I, I, I knew when I said this that I would not be invited back <laughs> to this well, I have not been invited back. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's really crucial because so much of our social interaction and our relationship to the world of, of politics, wherever, wherever that happens to be, and that includes petty politics, is that we want to be invited back mm -hmm. to the room, whatever that room is. Exactly. And I think the risk is sometimes we have to take the risk of not being invited back by mm -hmm. precisely saying the thing that no one wants to hear. And that, that the thing that points out some very fundamental inequalities and power structures and things like that. So that's why I thought it was really a really crucial moment. Uh, yeah, because it was a choice. It's a choice and you, you make it. Once you make it, you understand that you're also accepting all the consequences of that choice. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the other chapter, Ethical Loneliness, has a couple of different conversations. And um, one of the conversations is with someone you identify as a, as a good friend of yours who happens to be white. And the moment is when um, you go, the two of you go see a play and all the white people in the audience are invited to, at a certain moment in the play to go on stage. And your, your white friend refuses to do that. <laughs> and you, <laughs> and the, you're obviously stewing over this. Why doesn't she do it? What's going on? And, and, and then it unfolds over a while. That's really fascinating because unlike the other conversation with white people who are, who are not your friends, this is a very, another kind of intimate moment of you know, trying to confront somebody who you think you know, and, and she reveals something about herself that surprises you. So maybe you can talk more about this and, and then what unfolds after that. Well, that in that moment, the, you know, the actress said to the audience, what if 
the white people in the audience could give the space to people of color. And, and so the white people, if they could just go onto stage and we could enact in the space of the audience something that's not enacted in the world, where people of color just have this space for five minutes. It was very close to the end of the play that this happened. And my friend and I had come as members of the Racial Imaginary Institute. <laughs> so I think that was even more galling to me in a sense um, because we were invited because of our membership in the Racial Imaginary Institute. And, as, and also we're in the play, so I can't talk to her. You know, it's not a moment of discussion that we could just start talking. And I'm waiting for her to get up and she refuses to get up. And I'm, I am in part um, fuming that she won't get up, but also really interested in my own rage at that moment. And it's, it was an interesting moment for me to be both clocking how um, disappointed I was feeling by her action and her inaction. Um, but what, what was interesting afterwards is uh, when I sent her the essay and said, you know, do you have a response? She, she did. And, and, um, and was able to break it down in ways that I don't necessarily agree with, but, it, but I do appreciate that she thought it through. And I think that's the, you know, that's the, sort of the foundation of our friendship. Right, right. So that's the optimistic side. I mean, the, the first conversation where the other woman said nothing after what you said, and this conversation where your friend did respond um, shows the, the, the risks that I, that I was thinking that you're undertaking, right? Now, the other conversation, I think, in Ethical Loneliness is with someone you describe as a Latinx artist. And I thought this was interesting because, you know, the book is not only about the relationship of Blacks and whites, but you also talk about other, other races in the United States, too. And, and this, this is a, an uncomfortable conversation for you, I think, because it brings up a different set of experiences that you're not as expert on as you are with uh, the Black-white dynamic and experiences of Black people. And you, you feel challenged a little bit, I think, in, in this conversation as, as you and the, the artist have a, have a different vocabulary and a different set of premises. Maybe you can walk us through what happened there. Exactly. Um, that was a dinner party. And I think I made a throwaway statement that um, came, actually, it's a statement that um, I heard from Frank Wilson, the Afro-pessimist, where he said, um, that Asians and, and Latinos were the um, junior partners in white supremacy. So it's a catchy statement and stayed in my head. And, um, and we were talking about um, somebody in the government who is Cuban. And, and I said, well, he's a Republican. And I said, well, he's, he's a junior partner of white supremacy. And she said, you can't talk about Cubans categorically. And how much do you know about the differences within the Latinx community? And, and then as that conversation unfolded, I realized how much I didn't know and how much I hadn't read. And um, and it was uncomfortable to be in a situation where I felt prepared to go one way and totally unprepared for a conversation where we were talking about how the um, Latin American community has developed in the United States. But I really appreciated the conversation and, um, and we then developed a, a friendship in where Every, the, the, every, the dynamic changed so that I was the one being sent to, to consider this or read this or think about that. And um, yeah, so th that I, I thought it was important to include that conversation because the book really is about not knowing and, and, and striving, as I said before, towards a kind of coalition building. And you can't 
build coalitions without having a sense of the investments of another person and, and, and sort of where you meet and where you part in terms of, of um, what they would like. I think Audre Lord and Adrian Rich is another example of um, that kind of long-term friendship that definitely benefited from being able to articulate the differences. Yeah, I mean, there's some truth to Wilderson's idea that Asian Americans are complicit in white supremacy, but it's also a much more complicated reality yeah, where there are Asian Americans who are, you know, exactly. resistant to that as as well. You know, I think it very personally. You know, yeah. yeah, no, because I mean, like you, Asian Americans break this break this down ethnically. Like, oh, this population is more pro-Trump than this population, et cetera, et cetera. And unfortunately. For Vietnamese Americans, we are the Asian American population that is most supportive of Trump. We're the only population that has a plurality of people who support Trump. Now, just because you, you support Biden doesn't mean you're not complicit in white supremacy, but there's a whole range of political possibilities. And unfortunately, for, for complicated reasons, Vietnamese Americans <laughs> end up with more support for both Trump and white supremacy. So I wrestle with that. Um, maybe we're, we're almost out of time. I just want to end with, with just talking about the book overall, you know, again, I just, I'm a big admirer of your work and, and of Just Us. And one of the things that I admire is from Citizen to Just Us, there's this willingness on your part to de defy all kinds of, of, of formal boundaries. You know, you, you started off as a poet, but I don't think poet is, is the right description for you in, in, in this book. And there's very little poetry, actually, in, in a very strict sense. I mean, it's mostly a kind of variation on the essay. Mm -hmm. you know, in journalism and reportage and things like this, but it certainly draws on some on lyrical impulses in your earlier work. But overall, you know, you, you, you were very uh, ambitious in bringing together all kinds of different things uh, from, from the visual image to screen captures of Twitter's, Twitter things to, I assume, your own pictures of people on the street. Um, did, did you plan this? Did, did you choose the, the wide ranging form or did you feel that the form chose you simply because of how the, the writing was carrying you along? I, I, I think that the form chose me in the sense that it was built. That when I needed a thing, I figured out how to do the thing. You know, I wanted the Jefferson notes on Virginia, but I didn't want all the text. So I thought, oh, I'll do an erasure and then I can just pull out the moments that I want. I, um, I wanted conversations historically, sometimes, the easier way to do that was to bring in an image. So it, it's, you know, I, I wanted the book to be a conversation in the way in which conversations happen, which means that you associate, you pull on things, you bring in other things, and in order to build towards a narrative that can communicate the thing that you want to communicate. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Claudia, it's been such a pleasure to talk oh. to you. Um, I, I really wish we could do this face to face as you as you talk about in your book. Maybe someday in the next year or two, uh, we'll have we'll have that. Well, chance. when your new book comes out, we'll 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 resume. <laughs> this, yeah, but I'm, I'm a pessimist. You know, it's coming out in March. I, I, I don't think we're going to be having face to face conversations at that point. Exactly. But, but we can meet again on Zoom and talk yeah. about it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Thanks, Claudia. Good luck with the book. Thanks so much. Thanks again for joining us. Claudia's book is Just Us, an American Conversation, and is available wherever books are sold. And in the link below, we have a few signed copies available for purchase. Thanks. Take care.